right. So I thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we had a lovely, lovely, lovely fall day today. Um, fortunately, I spent too much of my time at a computer today. I didn't get out as much as I wanted to. I did go out a few times to do a little bit of um, sort of poking around in the garden, see what's going on. Um, but I didn't get to spend as much time out there as I want. So tonight we're gonna talk about all the wonderful things that you need to know and to do in the fall in the garden to have a healthy yard. Um, we're gonna go over these points here that you see on the screen. We're gonna um, talk about the Pacific Northwest climate and how that affects the choices we make. We're gonna talk about companion planting and how that works and why that's helpful uh, to set up your garden, uh, looking at how plants interact with each other. We're gonna talk about some of the activities you can do in the fall that are helpful for the garden. And then we'll have a little specialized um, look at pruning techniques and pruning um, different kinds of plants. And one of the things I wanna point out is we talk about this time of year, though it's not necessarily the right time of year to plant prune everything, uh, but we want you to be aware and sort of be planning for the year about what you're going to be doing. All right, so we will, we talk about the Northwest climate. We're talking about an area that's by maritime bodies of water. We have lakes and rivers surrounding us. We have mountain ranges. Um, we're sort of flanked in between uh, in the Puget Sound Basin. Uh, because of all this, we are moderated um, temperature-wise by all of those features, and that helps give us this um, lovely climate uh, that gives us wonderful um, planting um, seasons. So if you're from here, you know this. If you're not, haven't been here very long, um, you know, introducing you to the type of climate we have here to understand that we have what's called sort of more of a um, Mediterranean type climate. It's not as warm, of course, as the Mediterranean is, but we uh, are more on par with places like California than other places um, in the United States. So if you're looking at this map, we look at plant hardiness zone maps, the one from the USDA in particular, to understand our region and what our low temperatures are. So it's looking at the kinds of lows we see here on average that plants can survive through. And that helps you make good plant choices. So you're putting in things that can be um, uh, hardy here and not uh, freeze out or not um, grow well. You can see this chart has quite a few ranges and it's been modified over the years. So all of these regions that you see here um, going into the tropical areas with the, the darker red at the bottom, uh, the, the minimum temperatures that we're looking at would be the wintertime temperatures. And the warmer regions, you know, 65 to 70 degrees. Well, we're in the eight zone, 8A eight and B typically. And so we can get down to 10 to 15, 15 to 20, but we don't always. And so we can have this sort of nice warm winter sometimes, depending on whether we're having an El Nino uh, weather year or not, and whether we get a lot of rain or not. Uh, those kinds of things make a difference as to how things grow over the winter. So the USDA plant hardiness zone map has been updated over the years. It takes a long time for them to make changes. It's already a little bit outdated, but it takes, you know, it's done sort of by committee. People decide, yes, we can say that the climate has changed enough that we can show that some of these areas are warmer than they used to be. And that uh, has happened. And so as you look at older zone maps, you'll see different temperature ranges. Um, and we have warmed, climate is warmed enough to be able to show that on the map. So then we also have, you can take the USDA garden map and just look at Washington state. And we have these different zones within Washington that are based on the Sunset Western garden map. And so they've been broken down into different numbers. So it get, can be a little confusing, don't let that throw you. But these numbers really are relative to what's going on around the state. And the, um, the numbers in the um, Sunset Western Guard map show the different microclimates that we have in, in uh, our state. And this is in particular, as we're looking at this, looking at Western Washington. So you can see that there are some 
differences depending on whether you're at elevation, like up in the Olympic Mountains or up in the Cascades over here on the far right, or whether you're down in the Puget Sound Basin. Um, some areas are colder, so as you get further south of um, Puget Sound, past Olympia, it gets a little colder, as you see in the foothills of mountains, like out in Sultan and, you know, areas that are starting to climb in elevation, it's a little bit colder. And then on the coast and in this Puget Sound Basin, we are have the warmest temperatures, the more moderated temperatures. So this helps you kind of decide, looking at like where you live. We all know that there's a convergence zone. Um, you can see that change happen as you look into wherever it is, where um, the zone changes. And so weather clashes in these areas and you can get more stormy weather sort of in these zones up here. Um, and that's just part of what we deal with and knowing where you live and what you're gonna be um, experiencing can help you with your choices. So the first point I wanna make is that it's always a good idea to plan a diverse garden. And that's in terms of sizes of plants, types of plants, whether they're deciduous or evergreen, uh, whether they flower, um, you know, have lots of flower, or whether the flower is inconspicuous, whether they put fruit on or not. Some things might attract wildlife to your garden, good and bad. And so you can take that into account. Um, when we do talks about wildlife gardens, typically people also ask us about all the wildlife that can be problematic um, because you're going to attract them as well. So we want to think about all of those choices that we're making. And then also think about how plants like um, their environment. Some of them might need more water than others. And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit and choosing the right plant for the right spot. When you're designing something, it's always a good idea to think about groups of plants, especially groups of plants that like the same environment. But also think about in terms of odd numbers, if you put too many even numbered things in, you end up with lines, sort of linear designs. And so we encourage people to think about groups of threes and cluster those so that you get a more rounded grouping when, you, when the plants grow out. Um, having variation in your canopy layer is important because that's going to encourage different kinds of wildlife, especially different kinds of birds, which occupy different areas. So some of them are ground birds, they're ground feeders, ground nesters. Some of them are up in the higher parts of the tree. And um, this gives uh, a lot more diversity to the wildlife that comes and um, visits your garden as well. And then just aesthetically, it's better to have a lot of variation um, and have clusters of, of types of texture than it is to have too much of, of one thing or too many individual things. It, it makes for a more cohesive look as you're looking across the landscape. And I like to tell people to think about when they're out hiking or taking walks, when you're in a natural area and you're looking especially like into a forest, that look at that, um, the way that looks and try to mimic that because that's gonna create, first of all, a very healthy garden um, in terms of bringing wildlife into it, but it's also going to um, be, um, visually pleasing to you. So, you know, again, looking at a forest, there, there are actually schools of uh, permaculture where you can learn about how to create a garden where uh, plants function together and they benefit each other. But part of that is looking at how the canopies interact with each other, um, how the ground covers function, uh, how the root systems function, uh, so you're looking at what's happening at every different level of where a plant occupies a garden. And then in this particular example, the forest garden, they're looking at a seven level beneficial guild. So all these plants are benefiting each other. You have large fruit and nut trees that provide canopy. They can provide shade to some of the uh, lower plants that are gonna grow underneath them. You can have a lower tree layer with dwarf fruit trees. Uh, you can have a shrub layer that has currants and berries and then do the herbaceous um, things that come and go that might die back in the winter and then come back in the summer. And that would be some of the vegetables that we grow or some herbs that are um, deciduous that die back each year. 
And then also look at how the root vegetables interact with other things as well, because you could grow something that has deep, a deep tap root in an area where there might be um, leafy growth above and take advantage of different the plant occupying different parts of the soil. So all of those things um, help to benefit each other. And then don't forget about the fact that you can have vertical things. You can actually use other plants to grow things into them. Um, you can also use structures like we saw in the picture before where you have the espalier picture, uh, espalier fruit trees against a fence, or you can use them to make a fence. So you don't even put a fence in but you actually use them and prune them in such a way that you've developed sort of this barrier uh, that um, creates a different room in the garden. So um, when we're talking about grouping plants that have like needs, you wanna think about, does this plant like a lot of water? Does it like a lot of sun? Um, does it need to be well-drained soil and be you know rocky kind of gravelly soil? The more you know about what a plant needs, the better you'll be able to group them. And so even when you're mixing plants up into different um, configurations, you can have plants that will actually um, benefit each other. And so it's easier to put in something uh, that's going to like the same thing than it is to try to have, um, oh, say, a blueberry, which likes a lot of sun, right next to a lavender, which also likes a lot of sun. But the blueberry likes water and the lavender does not. The blueberry can tolerate boggy soil and the lavender needs to have well-drained soil. So it's important to not mix things like that together because you're going to create more work for yourself. It's less efficient to water it. So you want to be thinking about those things. And these are plant examples here, euphorbias, um, grasses, sedum. And there are some that are blooming now that are tall. And these are really great for late season pollinators. Ceanothus, that beautiful blue flowered shrub that we see in early summer that is just you know, hanging over people's rockeries or sometimes they can be quite large in a yard. Lavender, sea holly or oryngium, Russian sage, epimediums, rosemaries, all of these love um, drier soils. I want to point out that they may take different um, conditions of sun, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then bog plants. So there are bog rosemaries that are pretty sweet, blueberry, red stem dogwood, and then there's a lot of um, species of carex and juncus, or things that we call rushes and sedges, that have grass-like look to them that you can see in this picture here. And these guys are not grasses, but they have a grass-like look. And they typically like more wet soils. There's a few of them that can tolerate drier soils, um, but you want to be putting those in places where they can tolerate them. So then when we're talking about plants that are gonna be pretty um, successful in the yard, Washington native plants are very successful because we have a period of dry weather in the summer where sometimes we don't get very much rain at all. And so you can get plants into your garden that will need little supplemental um, irrigation. And then you don't have to spend as much time watering and you don't have to spend as much money watering and we don't use up as much water. We are now in a period of um, uh, not forced restriction, but voluntary restrictions on water use, even though it's been raining. And we, you know, it seems a little contradictory. We see the rain, we think, why do we have to save water right now? But the water levels in our reservoirs are not as high as they should be at this time of year. We have to get through the winter and they're not predicting a super rainy winter. And so that's not gonna fill back up necessarily to the levels we will need them for next year. So what they're asking you to do right now is proactive. It's not necessarily that we're running out of water right this minute but that in six months, eight months, a year, we could be seeing a more severe water shortages. So thinking about those plants that can um, thrive in a garden without irrigation is always a good choice. Um, we have things like all these wonderful ground covers that you see in the Northwest and the woods. Wild ginger is one of my favorites. It also it has a gingery smell to it. You can actually eat it, it is edible. Um, it has these really cool little purple flowers. Um, that you have, you have to get down there to look at them, but it gives you something to explore in the garden. Um, but all of these things are really good choices 
they're aesthetically beautiful. They are not going to um, have a lot of disease or insect pressure um, issues in the garden. Some of them have beautiful scent and flowers on them, like the mock orange, the red flowering currant, which is a wonderful plant for uh, overwintering Anna's hummingbirds. Uh, some of them have fruit that's edible, like um, the thimbleberry. Um, also, you can use things like Douglas fir. The new growth on Douglas fir is a good um, cough uh, medicine, so to speak. You can chew on the tips of fir tree, and that's um, helpful if you have a sore throat. So there are a lot of really useful plants that are also very beautiful. We, we have some beautiful plants in this area. So when you're thinking about companion planting, basically you're thinking about combining two plants or more for a particular purpose. You're trying to combine plants in the same area that maybe will help each other grow or will occupy different spaces in the, in the landscape or one will bring in pollinators for the other. Um, there's lots of things they can do for each other. Um, there are some plants that will um, have a little pathic effects in that they will repel other plants from growing around them. And sometimes that can be helpful to also keep weeds down. So there are some fun facts about plants when you start combining them to learn about. So here's an example of shallow and deep rooting. Carrot roots um, grow much more deeply than a lettuce root does. They There are more downward sort of, it's it's a big tap root. Obviously we're eating this big tap root when we pull a carrot, but all of the little hair roots that come off of that are also very linear and very downward facing. And then lettuce roots go a little bit more horizontal. So you can take up more space underground, you know, growing carrots and lettuce together. There's gonna to be a lot of room for the roots underneath as opposed to if I were to put in um, a tomato plant and then try to go grow lettuce with it, <clears throat> the tomato is going to take up all the rooting space. And then the lettuce is going to have as very little um, room to move, so to speak. So thinking about how you pair things up, you can use this application also for ornamental plants, as well understanding which things have more of a tap root and which things have more of a, um, a broad root system. You can have things that are short and tall that grow together. You want to be thinking about which way is the sun moving in your garden? Because if I put a big trellis full of peas in front of my tomato plants that I'm trying to grow up, by the time the peas are up and producing, I have tomatoes in that I'm trying to get growing and I don't want to shade them. So the tomato then would come to the front or these onions, like you see in this picture, which prefer more sun. On the other hand, you could use trellises of things like green beans, um, or you could use a little sort of um, circular uh, trellis like you see in this other picture with cucumber to grow over it. That's gonna create a shady spot. And that shady spot is a good place to put out transplants of summer lettuces. Lettuce is a cool season plant. You can continue to grow it through the winter I mean, through the summer if you want to, but you need to make sure that it's getting enough shade and co uh, cool enough spot. Uh, some of them will just sort of peter out and they are only, a, they only live a couple months in the, in the garden. And so they will go to seed on you and they're gonna bolt faster, the hotter they are. So thinking about, you know, how do you mix these things up so that you're occupying um, different spaces and everybody's getting the kind of sun that they need. Um, think about when things are being harvested. In, in, a, in a vegetable garden, we're planting things right now like garlic. Garlic goes in in October, but it doesn't come out necessarily till July at the latest. So maybe June, July. But by then, you might have wanted to put tomatoes in, but you wouldn't be able to because you're waiting for that harvest to happen. So then you have to plan, what is it I would put in after garlic if I know it's going to occupy all this space? Um, the same thing with peas. If I'm growing peas up a trellis, what I want to have follow it, or do I just want to switch that out completely and start with other smaller plants um, below it that are going to occupy that, that space when the peas are gone. Um, putting in things like um, collards, um, pansies, lettuce that you see in the uh, picture on the right this time of year, these will live for a while. Pansies will overwinter. They are edible. 
collards and broccoli and cabbage and kale and all of those things in the cabbage family, the brassicas will winter over just fine. They have a nice thick leaf. Something like lettuce will grow for quite a while, but with hard frosts and heavy freezes, they will die. So you think of them as a fall harvest, but you can see in this garden, this is a beautiful fall garden. This lettuce is gonna be perfectly harvestable soon. It's already getting to size there. And that um, brassica behind it will continue to grow and those pansies will continue to grow. By the time you pull that lettuce out, they will fill in and, and you won't have gaps in the garden either. So you can think about the different harvest times that are coming and how to maximize that and also how to keep your garden looking full at the same time. So some things are long season, as I mentioned, when you're putting things in like garlic, you got to think about that. Also, um, tomatoes, it's a commitment. You put a tomato in in May, it's there until now. I just pulled mine. Um, I wasn't getting any more new tomatoes and I had a few green ones. I probably could have left it through this week because we ended up getting a little bit warmer weather, but I had time and I knew I wasn't gonna have time this weekend and I didn't wanna lose them. So I went ahead and picked some green things and now I'm ripening them inside. Um, you could do the same thing um, now, you know, if you haven't pulled your tomatoes out, you can make that judgment call. We're gonna get a little bit warmer weather through the weekend, but then it'll start to get rainy and cool again. Um, and you may lose those tomatoes that are still developing. Tomatoes will split when they get too much rain and too much moisture. And um, then you also have the, you know, possibility of slugs, which are becoming a little more prominent right now. I've been finding lots of baby slugs on things, um, you know, getting into things as well. Some things are very short season. So lettuces are short, radishes short, cilantro. Cilantro is one of those things we think about putting into salsa. So we think about it as you know, it's a, it's Mexican food. This must be a warm weather plant. And in fact, it's not. It's a, it's a springtime plant. It actually loves spring cool weather. Fall is a great time to plant it because you can get a good crop out of it. Um, and cilantro is one of those things that um, it grows very fast. It will bolt very easily and go to, go to flower and then go to seed. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It has flowers on it that attract pollinators. It drops seed in the garden that you that will regrow again, and it can live over the winter and just be dormant and then come back in the spring um, and sprout. And those seeds are coriander, so you can collect them and use them as a spice. So it has multiple uses. I don't like the taste of cilantro. I'm one of those people that it tastes like soap too. So unfortunately, but I grow it because it's beautiful. It has these flowers. I love coriander. And I like things that self-seed in the garden and regrow because then I have a more natural looking garden. Um, there are a lot of perennial edibles too. And perennial plants, even some of these annuals and things that are long-term annuals like the um, kale are great to put into ornamental areas and in, into pots maybe together clustered with other ornamental plants because they're long lasting, they're sturdy, they're decorative. Um, but things like rhubarb, for instance, you could put into a decorative border in a perennial bed. Um, asparagus is a perennial. You invest a lot of years in that. It'll take a few years to get to actually do anything for you. So thinking about, you know, what kind of plant is it? How does it grow? Um, parsley might last a couple of years because it's going to go to flower in the second year. You can leave a carrot in the ground that you didn't pull and let it flower. Again, great pollinator plant. It's not gonna do anything more for you than that. You can't eat it at that point. Um, it gets woody, but it's gonna have this beautiful flower that attracts all kinds of bees. And that's worth it just for that. So that's a biennial, blooms in the second year. Um, and then there are different ways to have plants help each other. So one of the most classic ways is through having plants in the pea family that actually have a way that they take atmos atmospheric nitrogen and it comes into the plant, gets into these specialized root nodules that you see clustered. This is not a disease. These are little um, root nodules where rhizobacteria is actually forming inside and helping to convert 
atmospheric nitrogen into a form that plants can use. And that is wonderful because now these, this plant is feeding itself essentially. There is a bit of leaching that happens when these are growing near other plants and that can feed the plants around them. And then when you're growing peas, for instance, instead of pulling them out, just cut them down and let all of that nitrogen just sort of soak back into the soil around whatever else is growing there. And that will help to feed it. And this is the, the theory behind some of the cover crops that we use. And we'll show you that in a minute too. Um, but you can do this also with your crops. So you can do it with peas, fava beans, uh, green beans, plants that do this. There's lots of other things. Um, and there's some more interesting specialized things that do this. You can also do combinations of plants that support each other. So as I mentioned, you could grow vines up into plants. So you can do that ornamentally. You can also do that with edible plants, taking like corn stalks and having um, squash grow up into them um, and beans grow up into them. Uh, the squash typically will stay on the ground, but sometimes, you know, you have lightweight enough, uh, enough uh, plants, you can get them to vine up and you can support them up in the uh, corn stalks as well. Corn's better always planted in groups because it's wind pollinated and the tassels need to be near each other. And so that's helpful anyway to support these guys. So this is a classic, what they call three sisters garden with squash, corn and beans. And there's other ways you can sort of be creative with that um, concept as well. Um, and so pest management, this is one of my loves, um, you know, just thinking about how we bring wildlife into the garden of all types. And when I talk about wildlife, I mean everything. I mean bees, I mean even wasps, which people don't like. I don't necessarily want a yellow jacket nest right in my yard where I have to deal with it and I'm worried about my safety, but um, I don't mind if somewhere in a more wild part of my yard, there is a bald-faced hornet nest, those big, huge paper nests that they make, as long as I'm not bothering it. Um, as long as I don't have anybody in my household that I need to be concerned about for safety if they're allergic. And I don't, and so I don't need to worry too much about that. And I've been stung by bald face hornets several times in the head because I'm a gardener and because I stepped too close to their nest. And it, it's just a matter of not seeing it. You have to pay attention to where they are. Um, but they are, wasps can be very beneficial insects. They're meat eaters. They eat a lot of other insects that are bothering your plants. So we have the, the um, insects that eat your plants and the insects that eat the insects that eat your plants. And we're trying to have a balance of that in the garden and not too many of those plant eating insects. Although you won't have the others if you don't have a few, you have to have something for them to feed off of initially but they can take down a population of aphids pretty quickly. Um, and so can something like um, parasitoid wasp or lady beetles, um, soldier, fly, um, soldier uh, beetles, um, the, the little um, hoverflies, which lay their eggs in plants that have aphids and the larva will run around and eat your aphids. So all kinds of cool insects, including flies, um, can be helpful in the garden. Um, of course, we're looking at pictures of some of the more beautiful and charismatic uh, guys here, our little hummingbirds who are here going after columbine. Um, we've got a little bumblebee here on, uh, looks like echinacea, bats. In the Northwest, bats are not pollinators, but they are insect eaters. They eat lots and lots of flying insects, especially mosquitoes. And then we've got um, butterflies and we are not, monarchs are not native to our area in the Puget Sound region. They do occur south of Puget Sound and through Oregon and California. And we have a West Coast population, but they migrate through this area. They are also in Eastern Washington. Um, they migrate through here going on their way to BC in the um, summertime. And then in the wintertime, they move back down to the, um, Central Coast of California and Southern California. So there are pockets of uh, monarch groves down there where you can actually go see them all clustered in the trees. Um, and they're, they're great. So we encourage people to plant certain things like milkweed to help them on their way. They do feed on the milkweed, so do lots of other pollinators, but also the larva um, need milkweed to survive. That's the only plant 
that these guys plant, uh, lay their eggs on. So we have other kinds of things that are going on in the garden that we aren't even aware of. So a little pathy I mentioned, this is where you have some plant that puts chemicals into the soil that inhibits other things from growing. So it can actually inhibit plants that you're trying to grow, but you can use it to your advantage. So for instance, rye, which is used as a cover crop, cereal rye can inhibit um, club root in the soil. And so where you have areas of lots of club root, which affects your um, broccoli and cabbage and those kinds of vegetables, you can help to um, inhibit it. But more than that, it can actually inhibit things like quack grass. So quack grass is a really terrible uh, weedy grass that grows by underground stem and just spreads everywhere. If you plant rye in those areas, you can keep it inhibited for quite a while. Um, and this, this could be like an annual cover crop uh, that you put in, or you just put it in where you have issues with it. So there are ways to use these to your advantage. Um, you can also use some plants to trap insects. Nasturtiums are very attractive to black aphids. And the black bean aphid, um, instead of getting on your beans, will go to the nasturtium instead. Now, it's a shame. Nasturtiums are edible. They're beautiful. We want to grow them. But it is a, a very easy way to just throw a few seeds in here and there and let them be sort of sacrificial crops. Um, and then you can attract beneficial insects in by having lots of really great flowering plants. Things in the daisy family, like marigolds, things in the um, mint family, like lavender, and then things in the carrot family, like cilantro, that have that sort of umbrella-shaped flower, are really good for that. Uh-oh, hang on. Sorry. There we go. All right, so let's talk about what to do for maintenance in the fall. This picture you're looking at is a picture of Picardo um, pea patch in Seattle. This is the 50th anniversary year for the pea patch program in Seattle, and this garden was the original garden. It is a two and a half acre um, garden in um, northeast Seattle in the Wedgwood area on 25th Avenue northeast north of University Village um, before you get to Lake City Way. This is an old bog. The Picardo family was an Italian family that owned this whole valley and actually farmed the whole thing and, and took their food down to the Pike Place Market. Um, turned this gar garden over in the 1960s to a woman who um, was a teacher in the area, um, a, a local grade school, and wanted to use some of the property to grow food um, for neighbors in need at the time when food banks were just starting up in the or in the late 60s. Um, by 1973, this became an official garden. Um, the city took over the program. Uh, they bought the land. It's owned by Parks Department and. This has been a community garden ever since and supports about 500 different plots um, in the site. It's amazing soil because it's boggy soil, but it's low to the ground. And so you see this sort of mist settling in here. It has um, earlier and later frosts and then the areas on the hillside right around it. And that's just like walking up and out of the garden, um, the, the climate changes a bit. So it's really an interesting place to see how thing how climate changes just or weather changes just in a small um, uh, setting um, but um, it's an area where this particular part of the field is now all permanent garden but it used to be seasonal and what you're seeing here is everybody gleaning what was left over and then it's going to get plowed and then cover crop was planted and so this is where we planted the rye and the rye would keep all that quack grass that kept coming into the summer garden at bay so people didn't have it just perpetually. Now that it's a uh, year-round garden, they've had to do a lot of management of that um, quack grass that wasn't uh, needed before. Okay, so I wanna make sure I'm not, my thing is going a little slow, so sorry about that. Okay, so let's talk about lawns for a second. It's a great time of year to be doing lawn work. Lawns are starting to grow again. Lawn is a cool season um, plant. Um, when you think about lawn, I want you to remember this is many, many, many different little plants all congregated together. And, um, and because of that, you can have issues because you have sort of a monocrop. Um, you wanna make sure that you have the right kind of seed for, for the Northwest. You wanna make sure you have the right kind of setting 
And so the basic needs of a good, healthy, sustainable lawn are to have enough sunshine. So six to eight hours of sun doesn't have to be all at the same time. It just needs to get that much sun during the day. If it's too shady, you're going to want to try alternatives. There are some grass seed that grow um, types that grow in shadier areas, where you're going to be perpetually managing that. Um, you want to make sure that you get enough water on it. You can let them go dormant in the summer. And so having hardier grass types or converting your lawn to more native grass types will make it more drought tolerant and you don't need to worry about watering as much. But doing an inch per week to a six inch depth is important if you're trying to keep a nice green lawn in the summer because you have to have a good depth of, of root. If you do it too shallowly, then your lawn isn't gonna be sustainable. You wanna make sure that the soil drains. Um, if thatch builds up on the top surface from the base of grass. You need to pull that out at times. You need to aerate, put holes in the lawn, let the water in, let the air in to keep the soil healthy. And you need to add compost and reseed it. If you think about the way people take care of lawns, when we mow, we take all the grass away and then um, we don't put anything back on it, but chemical fertilizer, that's not a healthy way to sustain a lawn. If you use a multi mower, you put the grass right back in and it's actually adding nitrogen back to your lawn. So if you mulch mow your lawn and, and do grass cycling, you only have to fertilize once a year and that would be like now, September to early October. So thinking about that, you know, how much work do you wanna do with the lawn? You can convert it to be a little bit more natural and not have to fuss as hard, not grow it in areas where it's too hard to grow too slip, steep a slope, too shady. Um, make it work for you so that you can have a good healthy lawn. So mowing height should be about two inches. You want to outcompete weeds. You want to shade your soil because that will help keep the moisture in. And this is especially important as you go into winter weather. And right now there's a lot of fall weeds, you know, that are going to try to dominate. Uh, dandelions are growing like game busters right now and, and gaining new leaves and, and, and strength, you know, and putting a lot of energy into the root system. So keeping the grass higher, um, do the grass cycling, um, use a natural organic lawn fertilizer. And what I mean by that is something that isn't made from chemicals, but is made from things that you would recognize, like it says, you know, it might say um, bat guano on it, or it would say cottonseed meal in a fertilizer. So there are different sources of ingredients that go into lawn fertilizers that you want to be able to, to um, recognize. Um, then you know that you're putting materials from rocks and plants on the lawn and it's going to be slower to release into the soil. You're also feeding the soil organisms. So the goal is to feed the soil and not the plant. Because if you feed the soil and you give the soil organisms all the things that they need, they convert all that to things that are available to the plant. In some cases, actually interact with the roots and exchange nutrients. Uh, fungi will penetrate roots at times and um, they are looking for sugars because they don't photosynthesize and they get sugar from the plant and they give the plant minerals and new other nutrients. So you need that exchange to be happening. If you use a lot of chemical fertilizers, you're killing all of that life in the soil and you're stopping that from happening. Um, phosphorus is not allowed in fertilizers in Washington state unless you're doing a brand new lawn or your soil test shows that you have a depletion of uh, phosphorus. And that's not common. Phosphorus and nitrogen, both in abundance, washing off into local waterways cause algal blooms, which can kill fish and kill um, different amphibian creatures and it's not healthy. So we're trying to avoid that by using things that won't cause that to happen. So right now, do you going to read seed or install a new lawn? Um, you should be aerating, you should be dethatching. So taking out that layer of thatch, you can see in this picture, there's a little bit of that dead grass there. If there's an only a little bit, you can do that just by a good rake using a, a metal leaf rake, the fan shaped kind, not the plastic ones, but a metal one that will help to pull some of that out. But you can buy, you can rent a dethatcher or buy one. And if you have a really bad thatch layer that will pull it out, it looks a little bare for a while, but that's why you do it now because it's cool enough for you to put compost down and new seed and it will grow really well. We just did this in the 
little garden at the Good Shepherd Center and the Children's Garden on our little um, demo lawn, uh, which has clover and other things, daisies and other things growing in it. So, um, you know, the best time to fertilize is September, but it's still, like I said, it's a little warm this weekend, we'll be fine. They're still building root reserves. The soil's still kind of warm. We're gonna look at that in a second too. So now's the time to be doing some of this. Good work. And then now's a really good time to plant. And we plant now because our soil is still warm enough. Um, roots will still grow. You're gonna get better root growth, which will establish, establish your plant while the plant's not also trying to put out top growth or new flowers or build fruit. It's not putting energy into all those things. It's just gonna put its energy into roots. Uh, rains are back. The soil's gonna be more moist, uh, help you keep them watered. This is a great time to put our spring bulbs in. I just got notice of the two places I ordered. One of them's on their way, so I was excited. Um, I have a lot of um, little species crocus that I ordered this year. I'm not still not sure where I'm putting them all, but I, I love them because they catch the light. They're really beautiful. Um, and then there's just going to be less stress for your plant because it's not so hot. So while they're building roots, they're not trying to trans, they're not transpiring as much. They're not exchanging gases as much and they're not gonna lose as much water. And then it's also nicer for you because especially when it's, you know, 65 degrees, it's beautiful weather to be gardening. You don't get too hot, um, but it's warm enough. Um, it's not, you know, not uncomfortable. So here's how you find out about your soil temperature. So there's this wonderful um, tool that WSU, Washington State University, developed. It's actually um, called uh, uh, Ag Weather Net, and you can see that in the name here where it's a sponsor, Ag Weather Net. Um, this is actually a screenshot I took, um, when was this, Tuesday. So Tuesday at 5.45 p.m., I looked up the Woodenville Station, which is probably the closest one to Bothell. They're not everywhere, so you pick the thing that's closest to you and extrapolate from there. And you look at all these different things that they tell you that they're measuring. So it's going to tell me when the weather station went in. It tells me what elevation it's at. Obviously, this is pretty much sea level, 47 feet. Um, it tells me even what kind of soil series. You can look that up if you want to. So this is a nice silty loam where this is installed. Uh, would be perfect farmland, obviously nice pasture there. Um, the thing that's most important is what I pulled out of this showing um, the air temperature. And actually the when I pulled it out was um, a few minutes later and you can see the temperature had already dropped a little bit. So now instead of 62 degrees, it's 61.2. But the um, soil temperature has stayed the same. So it doesn't vary that much. You can see the difference here is nothing. It's 57.4 and the same over here. But they're measuring a two inch depth of soil temperature. This helps you to know how warm the soil is. When things are at 60 degrees, that's when we're planting tomatoes. That's when we're putting all our warm weather things. So obviously they're still gonna be comfortable out there right now, um, but we don't plant things as the soil starting to get cooler that are gonna need a warmer soil temperature. So you can be sort of monitoring this and, and seeing when things are changing. Um, super helpful tool to kind of predict what, what's gonna happen, looking at what's going on um, currently, um, coupled with sort of just looking at kind of consistent knowledge about what might happen in the area in general that we know about historically. I love this tool. Um, plants will have less stress if they have cooler temperatures when you're planting them, um, but we do also want to add mulch back to the soil when we plant because not only does it help to keep moisture in and it helps to keep all these new, you know, cool weather weeds that are going to want to be cropping up, as soon as you disturb soil, light hits the, into the soil, you know, as you're, as you're disturbing the soil, light gets into all different pockets of uh, exposed soil and helps to actually um, germinate seeds. So some seeds respond to a flash of red light with the red spectrum and germinate. And so when we disturb soil, we can actually be causing more weeds. So when we're pulling weeds, it's important to put mulch down after. But the main thing for this time of year is that soil temperature moderation. So mulch will help keep soil warmer in the winter 
and it'll help it keep keep it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter is important to keep those roots healthy to keep them growing especially for conifers that still photosynthesize to some degree so anything that's evergreen is still breathing um, you can have your car parked right next to an evergreen tree in the winter time and the side that's next to it will be frost free in the morning and the side that's out on the open street will be all frosty and that's because the tree is um, letting off gases and helping to warm the air. So you want to keep those things healthy. You want to plant the right thing in the right place. Um, this is the Arbor Day Foundation's little schematic I think is great because it also shows things about like looking at power lines and where they run. We've had City Light in the neighborhood recently here where I live in North Delridge that are doing some tree pruning because there's things that are getting into some of the lines. And, um, you know, they have to keep them out of the out of the wires or we get power outages and it's dangerous. It could be dangerous for people. So you think about, you know, choices of heights of trees, things that are gonna block wind, or is it deciduous or evergreen? You know, how's, how's it helping to do what it needs to do? The more you can plant that you know you don't need to prune, the better. Um, you know, we are gonna talk about pruning, but really pruning is something you do to correct something, or if you're really trying to manipulate something like a fruit tree, but the more you don't have to prune, the better, because it's gonna keep your plant healthier. Whenever you cut into something, you're wounding it, and you can introduce disease to it. Um, so, you know, again, as we talked about, you want your plants to be successful and you want to be able to wa manage the water right, but you also want to be able to, you know, have the tree or the shrub grow to its potential and look like it's supposed to look. So in this area, this is how our winter rains um, go. You can see that they start picking up, you know, now. Uh, November tends to be our rainiest month. December, sometimes precipitation in December and January is in the form of snow. Even as, you know, can be February and even into March. We've had snows in the beginning of March before. It starts to dry out after that. And so this, this is a um, map that was created in 2023, so fairly recent. And what we have been seeing is that June is starting to become a little drier. And June has become one used to be one of those months we depended on for this weird what we call the you know June gloom um, that raininess and, and and wetness is important to help keep all of our conifers and uh, big trees healthy through the summer because it recharges the soil because after March things have dropped off a bit <clears throat> and then we get into July and August and we can be very dry and there can be almost no rainfall sometimes like we had very little this year so you need to be able to know when these things are happening, to know when water's running off, when storm water might be an issue. Um, you know, think about if there's places you have too many impervious surfaces that you need to manage and redirect back into your property, store in a cistern, put into a rain garden, or do other things like that. Um, and then you can help to recharge in June um, get your soil recharged again before you go into those summer months. Cisterns don't often take you all the way through the summer, but they can help now, especially with this drying out that's happening. So plan for smart watering practices. If you don't have an automatic irrigation system, you know, how are you watering? What are your methods? What is the most efficient way for you to do that? If you're not doing something that's easy for you to do, it's not gonna be successful. You won't do it often enough and you won't do it um, long enough necessarily. Um, and you don't, may not wanna spend all that money and waste all that water. So drip irrigation can be really helpful. Um, drip, um, drip hoses, can um, just let water out very slowly over a long period of time, and then the water just wicks into the soil around it. Having a water wand that has an on and off valve is helpful so you're not watering, you know, as you're moving around the garden. And I really recommend using other methods than hand watering for in-ground plants because you can never water them long enough. It's better to have some sort of drip irrigation. Um, this picture on the right is also a different kind of drip emitter that you can install and you can have these little hoses go out in all directions and just let water out. But it depends on how you've organized your plants um, as to how you do that. 
on a big lawn area, these rockers, these big rocking um, sprinklers can work more efficiently. Um, just remember when you're doing them, windy days, it's going to blow a lot of water away. It's going to evaporate more. When it's too hot out, it will evaporate. So early morning irrigation is good um, and turning them low so that they're not going up quite as high and cover. They still cover quite a distance, um, but let them soak in well um, so that you get good depth of watering. Soil testing is important. Now's a good time to do that, to get a baseline, to see how your soil went, especially in an edible garden over the winter. Um, you know, you can see what happened this summer. How, have you depleted things? You're going to usually see a lack of nitrogen because you usually are using it up a lot. If you have areas where you are concerned about toxins, you can do um, some extra testing to find out about heavy metals or um, hydrocarbons. The Asarco smelter didn't really affect Bothell so much as some other areas in Puget Sound, especially down towards Tacoma, Vashon, Maury Island, uh, Federal Way, Des Moines, Burien areas, very affected by it. So, the, you know, it was a big old well, smokestack that pumped out a lot of stuff for a lot of years that had cadmium, arsenic, and lead in it. And so those are legacy pollutions that are still there. You could be down one of cement plants. I'm over the hill from cement plants. I'm fortunate they're not really too much coming over here, but I'm close to them. Um, old substation sites, industrial sites. Was it an auto shop? Was there a lot of gasoline spilled? Orchards could have had pesticides sprayed on them and some of them used to have arsenic in them. And then houses that were built before 1978 um, could have had lead paint. So some of the older homes, the paint chips off and gets into the soil and there's still lead in the soil. Um, if you're along a busy highway, you could be getting pollutants from cars. Um, you know, there's just different ways in, in urban areas that we are affected by this and things to think about. We do recommend raised beds for that reason. Um, you know, for vegetable gardens, then you can control what's going into them. The place that's difficult is if you are in a flight path and you're getting pollutants from airplanes, sometimes um, those are things you have to be aware of and, and to wash off your vegetables. Um, good to always add compost to the soil. Compost is always our go-to. If you have very clay soil, you add compost, it opens it up. If you have very sandy soil, you add compost because it helps to hold moisture in and helps it to drain well, but not drain completely out. Mulching your garden beds, you can use things like leaves or wood chips or compost. Compost is not gonna be as effective a weed barrier as other things are, but it can help be a nice, uh, good looking um, mulch to put into places like a vegetable garden. Um, grow cover crops, choose those natural organic fertilizers, um, do that aeration. Here's a lawn that's been top dressed with compost that you can see even here. And the goal is not to cover the grass, but to get it to sink in between the grass blades. Um, and then if you want to, you know, start a new play, a new garden and or kill a piece of lawn that you want to put a garden bed into, sheet mulching will help to put organic matter down. You're putting cardboard or newspaper down and then wood chips over it or compost and wood chips. And that actually helps to build the soil while you're getting rid of whatever's under there. Or if you have a, a weedy spot, that will work. So choose the right mulch for the right site. Perennial trees and shrub beds, ground covers, paths do great with wood chips. Um, veggie gardens and annual beds do nicely with compost where things are gonna fill in and sort of cover the soil so that you don't have as many weeds. Leaves work everywhere. Don't throw your leaves away. If you have leaves in your yard, use them. If you have too many, bag them and save them and use them later. Uh, they make a great mulch as they break down. They also make a good compost as they break down. You can use straw. You wanna buy organic straw that hasn't been treated with herbicides. Uh, those are good for veggie gardens. Um, you can find commercial mixes that are manure and straw or manure and wood based and those look like compost, but they have a little more weed uh, control. And then in areas where you're trying to do paths, you can use things like gravel. Um, in rock gardens too, people use gravel in rock gardens. What we don't usually recommend is bark. Bark is actually by nature a water repelling substance because its job is to keep water out of a tree. And so shredded bark can actually be very water repelling and keep the soil dry underneath. 
um, unless it's well composted, which you know you can let that compost down. You can mix it with other things and that will make it better. But what we really love is cover crops. So I do have some examples of cover crops. So I have, I don't know if you guys, let me see if I can see my picture, I can see. So here's one, this is rye. So it's a type of um, annual rye grass. And you can see some of that in the bottom right picture, the grassiness. We have crimson clover, which is that red flowering plant. So that's this guy right here. And these are just little samples that we started that we can show people what they look like so they know what they're looking for. When you plant cover crops, it comes up and it looks like weeds and we don't want you to pull them. So we want you to know. This is vetch. Both crimson clover and vetch get flowers. They're in the pea family. They have those specialized root nodules. And then this is a type of oat. This is a cereal grass. So cereal grasses and pea family plants are pretty traditional for um, fall cover crops. These guys protect the soil by keeping the rain from hitting it too hard and compacting it. They keep the nutrients from leaching out of the soil. Um, you lose a lot of calcium this time of year, which is why our soils are acidic, by rain taking it into lower levels of the soil where the roots can't get it. They add nitrogen to the soil, both with the root nodules and the pea family, but also when you cut them up and mix them in, all that leaf blade has tons of nitrogen and they actually help to bring more uh, soil microorganisms in because you've fed the soil. Um, it adds organic matter, which helps to change the texture of the soil and it can help keep all these weeds at bay um, so that you don't have a bunch of weeds. You, you leave a vacuum, you leave bare soil, something's gonna grow there. So you might as well choose what you're letting grow. Um, and we do these grasses and legumes in the winter time. And then there are other things you can do in the summer as well. So here's some pictures up close. You can see the dense weed, I mean, dense root of this rye grass. Some of them just really hold the soil. They can help with erosion, um, but they can help break up soil and really like uh, open it up for you. And then when you dig all that in, it all dies back and you've put all that organic matter back into the soil. Here's pictures of vetch and crimson clover in bloom and those nodules that I mentioned, and both of these have those on them. Um, lots of nitrogen coming out of these guys. They have more tap roots. They have deep roots that will break up soil. Uh, vetch, fava beans, crimson clover, Austrian field peas. You'll see things like winter peas, all kinds of pea family plants. Some of those like the fava beans, they're edible too. You can let them grow and, and produce food that you can eat as well. And some of these cereal rice, some farmers use them to actually harvest the cereal grain and then they dig them in as a cover crop. So let's talk about pruning a bit. Um, basics in pruning. Now's not the time of year to prune everything. So you need to know when a plant flowers um, because that will help you help guide you as to when the best time to prune is. There are some great books that we have in the resource section talking about, you know, um, so you can learn that. So you know, nobody knows everything. I have to look things up all the time and remember what about that? Things like clematis, for instance, there's different uh, types of clematis, uh, different groups, you know, that they, they group them into different groups so that you can say, oh, this one you should prune, you know, right after it flowers and this one you cut down um, at, in the you know after it's done and then it comes back in the spring and so there's different ways to manage them. Um, you do want to do certain things right now though for sure. So if you know you have something that has diseased branches, take that out. You know, take those twigs out. If something died, take the dead wood out. Sanitize your pruners between cuts. You can use you know something like hydrogen peroxide to just sort of clean off your pruner blades something to you know de, de, um, de, uh, disease free, get them disease free because you don't want to be moving that around as you're cutting new things. Um, if you have a, a shrub that's grown into a tree but you don't want it so much a tree, it takes a while to bring it down. Don't do it too quickly. We do typically tell people not to prune more than a third of a plant at a time of a woody plant. 
um, but take your take your time, take a few years to bring it down. And then stand back and look at what you're doing to see how it looks because you're up in the plant, you're not necessarily seeing, oh, that thing I pruned, whoops, that was something that was actually filling a space in, in this corner of the plant. So there are some basic tools that you need to use. Um, there are things we recommend over others. These type of Felco pruners are, are one of the best. They have a good type of blade, which is pretty sharp. They have a little place you can cut wire. You can replace these blades when they get too nicked and worn. You can sharpen them. Um, they have parts like the spring. If it gets too rusty and used up, you can get a new one. So there are replaceable parts for them as well. And they have nice handles. They're easy to use. There's different kinds for left-handed pruners. There's ones with more ergonomic handles, some that rotate to save your wrist if you're doing a lot of pruning. Um, if you're pruning something you need to reach for, there's different types of loppers. And so some of them are more anvil shaped like this one on the right. And you know, if you're cutting a bunch of dead wood, that doesn't matter so much. It's better to use, use these, um, these ones with the curved blades for nice, more precise cuts. Um, these are sharpening tools that you see here. There's lots of different ways you can use oil on them and different stones. Um, and then um, saw, saw blades, folding saws, are great. You can get these sharpened, keep them sharp. There's a lot of great Japanese pruning tools as well. Um, but these things, you know, choose the right thing. If you have too thick a branch, a saw is going to help you more than uh, a pair of uh, loppers will or even a hand pruner. So there are basic cuts that we like to teach people. I'm going to just do a time check here. And so we want to be able to thin things and we're going to prune it back to where it originates on the stem or a branch or a trunk. And we're trying to make the plant overall just somewhere open. We might want to head something back and we're wanting the plant to bush out. And so this is where you do selective pruning, where you can head something out. You know that if I, if I cut um, this little tip out, these two pieces are going to be what grows next. As soon as you take a growing point out of a plant, the next points down on the branch become the growing points. And so this is a hormonal change that happens in plants. And when you prune, and why we don't recommend doing tons of pruning right now, you stimulate a plant to grow. And so we don't want you having things growing a lot right now. And then we get into colder weather and things get damaged or it gets too wet. Um, and, and also it's wet. And so you don't want things getting too too diseased um, from this. So these are things that you look at um, March through June, so spring pruning. Um, you're gonna always do those broken branches. You're gonna always do that dead wood, but you wanna stay away in the spring from things that bleed. So dogwood and grapes, for instance, can be um, things that let a lot of sap out. So you need to do them when they're dormant. So you wanna do those earlier in the year, maples, walnuts, birches. So we're showing pictures of things you wanna be careful of here. Um, spring bloomers grow usually on things formed last year. So things like a rhododendron, this is a classic pruning example. Rhodes bloom have already set their buds. They set them last summer. I didn't get mine pruned out on my back porch. Now it's kind of, encroaching on my porch. Next year, I'm going to have to like prune it harder because I didn't prune it this year. And so you prune it when those flowers have faded. Um, you can, you know, often we tell people the deadhead roadies, take those dead flowers off. And that's when those new buds are going to start growing. They grow both leaf bud and set their flower buds. But you want to prune it before those flower buds are set, unless you don't care that you don't have a flowering period next year. Um, and you, so you can do it later, but you will lose your flower. So forsythia is another one of those things. Forsythia is also a hallmark plant to know when to prune your roses is when the forsythia is blooming, because that's usually about the time when it's okay to start pruning them. Um, so if you have plants that um, you prune really hard, a hot, dry summer can be really hard if you're pruning in the summertime. So thinking about like, 
we had that heat dome a couple of years ago in June. June things were growing out and and the leaves weren't hardened off yet. So there was a lot of damage that way. And there were things we needed to prune because of that. So not only can newly exposed bark be damaged by sun, but so can those leaves. If I prune my rhododendron in a day when it's too sunny and hot, the leaves that are underneath it get sun scorched. And then that's not helpful because they're evergreen plants and they don't fall off. And then I have to look at that for years. So knowing your timing will help with those kind, making those kinds of uh, mistakes. But this time of year, June through August, is good for taking water sprouts and suckers out of trees. And these, this is a list of things that actually uh, will form in those types of um, plants. So witch hazel, especially fruiting trees, you'll see that in lots and cherries and plums, dogwood trees, a lot of water sprouts. Now, I want to do caution you that dogwood trees don't like a lot of sun on their bark, and sometimes they'll sprout in defense of that, and it may be that the tree is in the wrong place. So it's something to think about and be aware of. Um, but in early summer, you're going to prune those spring bloomers, and in late summer, if you want to reduce growth on fast growing plants, sometimes things like grapes, you may be doing another pruning too. You might do two prunings a year because you need to get ahead of that growth that's just going to go crazy, that grow really, really fast, or wisteria, for instance. Um, so summer bloomers, your bloom, the bloom on current year's growth. So again, you just need to be aware of what the weather's doing and the drought stress. Um, often these guys don't need a lot of pruning, and this is why I advise picking plants you don't need to prune a lot, because you don't want to stress them out. Any cut you make can introduce disease, and you are stressing the plant in general when you are pruning them. So um, the less you can do, the better. The nicer form they're going to have, um, the less manipulation that you do. So this time of year, you're going to make things more susceptible to frost, as I mentioned, so don't do a lot of heading cuts that will stimulate growth. Um, there could still be drought. It has been raining, but I would venture to guess if I were, I haven't dug in my beds yet, but if I were to go out and dig in a garden bed in my backyard, I'm going to find some dry soil underneath. I don't think it's really saturated yet. Um, and I would know more. My, my backyard gets pretty wet, uh, has a, underground springs in the hillside. Uh, fungal diseases are more prominent this time of year, um, but this is a good time, fall is a good time for doing a little thinning and doing some deadwooding. So you could take, for instance, um, something like a redstone dogwood, and what we're looking here at here is midwinter fire, which has the yellow that goes from yellow to orange to red, beautiful plant, and you could do a little thinning of those. You could bring those in, they would be decorative in a vase in your house. They may even leaf out and you could get uh, roots on them and, and start yourself a new plant. They will propagate pretty easily. So you could do a little thinning of these and you're not going to hurt them that badly. It's a good time to see the structure of them um, for things like that. And then fall bloomers can include things like um, Calicarpa, the beauty berry, um, Camellia sasanqua starts to bloom. Um, I eat my rosemary is just starting to bloom out on my parking strip. And it blooms from now until April, May. Um, Oregon grape. So these are things you want to be careful. You don't want to prune all the flowers off. So I have been trimming some of my rosemary, but I'm looking carefully to see where those flower buds are because I don't want to take the flowers away. The Anna's hummingbirds love them this in the winter. Um, and then late winter is a great time for things like fruit trees. Um, so you want it, but you want to be careful that you're not doing it when it's too wet. The reason people do fruit trees in the winter is you can see the structure of them. You want to be careful with stone fruit in particular, um, but apple trees are great, pear trees, things like that. And then you want to take the stone fruits like cherries and those guys and do those more towards summer when they finish their fruiting. Um, but you can look at the structure of a fruit tree this time of year. Say you don't want to prune your cherry yet. In, in December or January, but look at it and make some notes about what you're gonna do to it when you can later in the year, because you'll be able to see it now. So these are some of the winter bloomers. Um, and a good place to go, if you wanna come down into Seattle to the Arboretum, go to the uh, winter, the Wit Winter Garden at the Arboretum. It's um, 
across the street and into the garden a little way, into the Arboretum a little ways up the path from the visitor center. And there's this amazing winter garden with all these things there. And some of these pictures, some of them come from there, obviously not this guy, um, but they do have this plant. Um, they have a Dwarthia there. This is Sarcococa, which you smell on the breeze. It's that beautiful winter uh, bloomer that has that sweet, sweet fragrance, almost like um, jasmine. And then witch hazels, and some of them are fragrant as well. And they have all of these things there. They're just amazing. Um, so here are some resources. And as I mentioned, I really want to point out these plants. So Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning is a really good um, guide. It, it tells you about all the different sort of kinds of plants, styles of plants, when to prune. Um, there's lots of uh, lists for how to pick plants, like the Great Plant Picks website right plant right place book and then teaming with microbes is a fabulous um, book to get acquainted with soil and soil health and um, what's actually going on in your soil we think about it as something to walk around on and not not thinking about that it's habitat and there are things living under our feet Thank and you. again this is the garden hotline if you want to call this is one of the programs that i work with and I was on the hotline periodically. I feel like I don't have to answer the phone quite so much anymore. I do miss it. It's fun to talk to people, but um, I'm helping them do all their outreach and all that good stuff. So they're there six days a week. This is a funded program through the uh, Has Waste program um, and Seattle Public Utilities for all of King County residents. Yeah, we'll leave that screen up. Uh, Laura's presentation is done, but we have some time for Q&A. Um, I also want to put up that second set of poll questions. As a reminder, if you fill out the poll questions, you can be entered into a drawing to win either a book about gardening or a $25 Molbax gift card or a 90-minute consultation with either Laura or one of the other experts at Tilt Alliance. So I will put those poll questions up right now, and then I'm just going to jump right into um, the questions here. We have two questions about pruning, but we also have one in the chat that asks, any tips on getting rid of moss that has taken over patches of my lawn? Yes, that's a, that's a question we get a lot. It's very common this time of year and also in early spring because this is that season where it's going to grow. Moss needs water to actually reproduce. It's a more primitive plant. It has these little, you know, beings that, you know, the, the little sexual parts that go into the water um, the, and they meet each other there and reproduce. You know, they, they couple and, and create new um you know, start dividing, cells dividing, and the plant starts to grow or the moss starts to grow. So with outstanding water, and I'm not talking about like a pond, this can be just a film of water, they can't reproduce. So often what's happening is something isn't draining properly. So check your drainage. Um, moss thrives in acidic soils. So, you know, you can check the pH of your soil. You can do that soil test. Uh, send it away and, you know, see whether you need to put calcium back onto the lawn that's been leached out. And that will help you to um, um, alka alka alkalinize your, I can't say that word, make your soil more alkaline. And that will help get rid of the moss. Um, you can also put holes in the lawn, aerate the lawn to get it to drain better. So that will help too. And then um, fertilize it because moss will also thrive in poor nutrient soils. So moss thrives in all the conditions that grass doesn't like. So if you are catering to your lawn and doing all those things that really help your lawn be healthy, you're going to have less of it. But then the other factor is shade. So we sometimes can't control that. Maybe your trees have grown up and you're getting a shadier area. Maybe somebody built a condo next door, which happens in Seattle all the time. We hear this story always. I had all this sun, now I got shade, what do I do? They have to change their garden because of it. And this can happen to a lawn as well. And so you would remove lawn from areas that have too much shade because you can't control that. And then don't worry about the moss and just plant Northwest natives that will grow happily with the moss and they'll be they'll be beautiful together. So moss is one of those things you have to change the conditions for. 
They sell lots of stuff at the store for that. Lots of moss killer. Some of it's not lovely. Some of it's just iron. And iron will kill moss. It all turns black. It can stain your sidewalk. It's going to be nutrient for the ground, you know, but it is a chemical. Um, but it does feed the plants. However, it doesn't do anything to change the condition and the moss just comes back. So you're putting money and energy and chemical into the ground for nothing. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend that at all. All right. Thank you. Another question, should you prune established blueberry plants? And if so, how? Um, yeah, so blueberries do need to be opened up once in a while. You need to take some of that dead wood out of there. Um, do a little stimulative pruning on them. Typically, I do that after they've fruited. You know, when all the fruit's gone, then I go in and, you know, just tidy them up a little bit. I don't do a lot of pruning. I think production wise, they probably prune more than I would. Um, and certainly you can find tons of info about that through different measures. You know, if you go to um, like extension agent um, info, like WSU's um, info about uh, fruiting plants, you're gonna find a ton of information about blueberries there, um, which is important. You also wanna know because there are some weird diseases that happen to them that look like drought stress hit them or like you pruned and something happened and and you want to know you know whether it's something you did or something that's just happening to your plant or what to do to prune that out but i would recommend looking at wcu's resources on blueberries because they have a ton of info um to to see it depends also on what kind whether you have a a tall blueberry or short you know the um high bush or not um there's a lot of different kinds as well all right, uh, we have a perennial wildflower garden. Do we cut them back now in the fall or wait until early spring? That's a great question. Leave, leave them be if you can. There's a couple reasons for that. One is when you think about perennials, this is their natural state. They die back, those tops sit there, they decay over the winter, they may break apart and fall on the ground. They are actually protecting the growing points of those plants that are under the soil or at the at the base of you know right out of the soil and so they they can be protective the other thing is that some of them have hollow stems and you may have native pollinators in there you may have like um, mason bees or leaf cutter bees that have gone back to bed inside and so if you're too tidy right now, you're going to be cutting out things that are going to be coming out later. But that will matter also in the spring, especially for something like a leaf cutter, which doesn't emerge until summer. And so you want to be inspecting as you, if you're going to cut, even when you do go to tidy things in the spring, or if you were to do it now, um, look at your stems if you have hollow stems. If you see somebody in there, at least put it back somewhere where you can protect it. Um, take care of it so that you don't lose those guys. Um, but it's always better to wait uh, because it's healthier for the plant unless you have a disease issue like botrytis and you'll know because the leaves are kind of turning black and mushy. Then you need to get that out of there. A mulch question. Commercial sources of mulch for raised bed garden to supplement leaves, grass clippings, etc. What am I looking for? Um, so commercial, you can buy commercial wood chips. They're usually cedar and they all look very uniform. When you get um, chips from Arborists through, and there's a company called Chip Drop, which can, you can order them through and they will bring them to you. Um, a couple things happen. One, you might have to take 10 yards and you don't have a place to put 10 yards. I never get them myself. I find them from my neighbors who have gotten them, who need to get rid of some because there's always somebody who has them in the neighborhood. Um, you may not have a place to put them, uh, to store them, and you may not have enough room in your yard for them. They, they look different each time you get them. Sometimes they're bigger, you know, and depends on how sharp their chipper is, that kind of thing. So if you really want something that looks more even, you can buy wood chips. But the other commercial mixes that I mentioned are things like um, fertile mulch, which is a sawdust manure blend, or sometimes you'll see um, wood, uh, very fine wood chip, uh, like wood shavings and manure. And the manure adds nitrogen back to the mix and it's not just wood and it makes it dark 
and they're composted a bit so it looks more like soil it looks like that and that's sometimes what people are looking for um sky nursery carries that their dijon's out in woodenville i think if if they are still there and i haven't checked this year so i'm not sure um used to do a chicken and chips mix which is chicken manure and the wood shavings um but sky nursery certainly sells a fertile mulch there's one more question. I hear this one, I think, in every workshop. And um, it, yeah, these are persistent little critters. How to get rid of moles from mm -hmm. your yard? The two top questions came up tonight, moss and moles. Mm -hmm. Moles are hard. When I, when I do classes about integrated pest management or pest management in general, and we're talking about beneficial insects, we talk a lot about insects. Um, and as I said, when I do that wildlife talk, other animals come up because there's lots of problematic animals. Mammals are the hardest thing to control. So whether that's a squirrel or, um, you know, a mole, you know, that's putting hills in your lawn. Moles are tricky. I don't have a foolproof answer for you. Different people have found success doing different things. If you're stomping down their pathways, you can usually see not just the hills, but the areas between where they're moving. If you compress those, sometimes you can force them to go deeper in the soil and then they will not be so obvious. They may still be there and they're not hurting anything. They actually aerate your soil um, and they eat grubs. So they're eating things like crane fly larva, European chafer larva, you know, they're eating the bad, bad bugs, but, um, the problem is when they come up too high, and that's often when the weather, when the soil's too wet below, they will come up higher. Um, that's why you see them at certain times of year more than others. Um, some people have success with putting, you know, weird things down their holes. You know, I don't know that any of that is going to be a hundred percent. What I have seen um, some people try is urine from predators. Uh, moles often aren't in a yard where there's a lot of dog activity, so they don't like dogs. Um, and then uh, you can actually go to a website called predatorp.com and buy urine from a coyote or urine from a wolf or, you know, different critters that you can strategically sort of put around the garden. And sometimes that will kind of deter them. But, you know, they're just going to go in your neighbor's yard or if you're near woods, maybe they'll go into the woodland. I've managed to get them out of lawns and into shrub beds before by doing the sort of walking on their thing, on their pathways. Um, and then I don't care as much because I don't care if they're making mounds in the, in the shrub bed. It doesn't matter. I think one of the most interesting things I heard for a solution was putting juicy fruit gum. Yes, in that's what I was thinking. That one? Gum. Yeah. I have no people, idea if that worked. Yeah. Um, some people say it has worked for them. I've not seen it work. Deer can be problematic. I imagine, you know, there are people maybe here tonight who have deer that come through the yard. I don't have any deer in North Delridge, but, you know, there are places in Seattle people do see deer now and then. And um, certainly in the suburbs, deer are everywhere. Um, there was a gardener we worked with over in Issaquah at the Pickering Barn Garden where we uh, Tilt used to maintain that garden. And um, he was working in some of the natural areas we didn't work in. And he was using um, ivory spring soap, the really strong smelling soap. And he put it inside a clear plastic cup <laughs> with a, you know, sort of put a little string into it and then ran the string through the cup and hung it in the trees. And none of the things that were hang they were hanging in did the deer browse on. They went around it and went and browsed everywhere else. So it did work. Um, you'd have to have a lot of ivory spring in your yard to keep the deer out of things. Um, but again, the predator pea can work for deer as well because they don't like, you know, they don't want to be around where there's a wolf, for instance. I know we're at time, but we have two more questions if you're willing to sure. stick around for, okay. Yeah. Uh, one is about finding, where do you find a good quality soil testing kit? Any brands that you recommend? I know the conservation districts offer soil testing. Yeah, um, I that? recommend the conservation district for your soil test. So um, King Conservation District 
we'll do a soil test if you're in King County and it's free. And you get um, four or five, I forget, now I'm just spacing on how many you get per property um, for the, you know, for you to do. So you could do like your lawn and your vegetable garden one year, and then you could wait a couple of years and do it again. And then you could do it again another time. Um, and then after that, you have to pay. If you're gonna do um, toxicity testing, you have to pay extra. But there are tons of different um, resources for soil testing. Um, there's lots of labs on the Garden Hotline website. If you go to the www.gardenhotline.org, we have a resource page. And on that page is a, is a document called um, Soil Resources for Edible Gardeners. And there's a bunch of labs listed there. And so they will test too. Um, well, you can use little kits that you buy, but they're never uh, that accurate. And you really want all the info they can give you because they're telling you about more nutrients than nitrogen. They're telling you more than your pH. They're telling you um, uh, the cation exchange, which actually shows how your um, soil is interacting with itself, so to speak, with all the different parts of all the different um, minerals in the soil and how they how they affect each other um, and whether how much nitrogen you have and whether it's available. I mean, there's just a ton of info in there and you can always call us to review it. We actually keep them in files um, and then review with people and then we can use them to teach you know people how to look at the soil test results. And if you live in the Snohomish County portion of Bothell, because we're a unique city and we cover two counties, or yeah, if you live in the Snohomish County portion, the Snohomish Conservation District also, I believe, offers um, soil testing. Yeah. So the link that I sent that Bothell website with all the resources from this workshop, I believe that's got links to both conservation districts. Great. Soil testing. And they and they both do fabulous plant sales, native plant. Oh, yeah. I shop both of them at because, different times of the year, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another question. I have chickens wandering the yard regularly, oh. and they dig up the surface. Are there any plants that would not like to get torn up right now in the fall? <laughs> they're mostly going to be, well, you know, if you're putting a pretty and you're trying to plant your pansies, they're going to go over there and eat them probably. Um, so yeah, you have to protect annual things usually from chickens. Um, perennials that are dying back, it's not the end of the world. You might wanna protect their little growing points. You know, if you have things like hostas that are dying back, mine are still looking okay right now, but you know, hostas are edible, so they might wanna eat those. You know, I, I would say it would be the more tender leaf things to be cautious of. Um, Chickens can be great. Not only are they spreading fertilizer in your yard, but they actually are finding bugs in the soil. They're really great under orchard trees. So where you have apples in particular or pears, where you have apple maggot and the apples have fallen to the ground and the maggots go into the ground for the winter, they find those guys, they pupate in the soil, they find them and eat them. So they can be really useful pest control. Um, I know a lot of people who have little like chicken tractors, they call them, but you can make little cages that have no bottoms. Um, that just contain them so they you can keep them where you want them and they will like work an area for you. So that's one way to sort of, um, you know, pro provide a little bit of protection or you put the chicken tractor over the plants you want to protect and let them let them free range around it because um, they're fun. They're fun to have running around. All right. That is all that we have received for questions for tonight. Um, thank you, Laura. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you everyone who joined us. We hope we see you again next Thursday. We will post a recording of this as well as all the slides by the middle of next week, hoping to have that done sooner, but I'll email all of tonight's participants uh, with a link to those resources. Again, thanks for joining us. I know a lot of people were watching football tonight. So I know, I thought about choosing that. Us. <laughs> And we'll hopefully see you all again next time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.